So without further ado, everyone, for one day only, every Wednesday we used to meet, we used to come together on Wednesday afternoon and create magic. It was Ariel and the bad guy. I got the figurine right over there. It's right over there in the corner of the set, still in my heart forever. We got the figurine right over there. Every Wednesday we would meet. And on this Wednesday, December 8, 2021, one night only, a reunion of Ariel and the bad guy. There he is. Wow. From the set. Wow. I feel like I'm watching a live stream of the YouTube channel. Chael, long time no speak. That was beautiful, Errol. What an introduction. Hey, it's great to see you. By the way, I've been watching the show. I am 100% on Neil Magny's side of this. I am confused why that Shamaya fight is not signed for a while. When both those guys went quiet, I put on my detective hat and I thought, oh, it is signed. They've got a deal. They're just waiting to announce it. But now I see what Neil's saying. Why? You got one guy in Neil Magny offering to do a job that nobody else appears to want. What am I missing here, Ariel? There's nowhere in the world that you go to a job interview. You're the only one that shows up and you don't get the job. What are we waiting on? Is there politics here? What am I missing? I don't see it. What am I missing? Okay, well, first of all, we can, I mean, I don't know how to ride a bike, but I've been told it's just as easy as riding. Are we just going to jump in? Are we not going to exchange pleasantries? Are we not going to say, hey, how are you? I mean, the fact that we're talking to each other right now, this is bigger than when, you know, Sonny and Cher reunited, the Beatles reunited, Yoko Ono and John Lennon. I mean, pick a duo. This is big. We're just going to, we're just going to blow by that stop sign and just get into the nitty gritty of the sport. That's what we're doing. I appreciate that very much. And to the audience, maybe it looks like we're getting back together, but we talk to each other yeah, almost do, every day. So maybe for me, I was more trying to get into it, but not because I don't feel the same and not because it isn't wonderful to see your voice. And what an honor. Thank you for having me on, by the way. I did wonder where my invite was. I think that's even what I texted you. Hey, man, <laughs> how come you haven't had me on the show yet? Didn't it start something it like that? Start. I, I, think I thought you didn't want. I thought you needed some distance. You needed some time away. You're doing your own thing. You're doing a great job with uh, – my good friend George Sedano, who I'm a big fan of, on the Chael Sonnen show every week on ESPN+. Plus. You see, I'm not petty. I could put people over. I could be friends with everyone, Chael. I'm a good guy. Hey, I appreciate that. And you're really missed over there. I, I mean, you really are. Like, Elizabeth had a concern that you wouldn't come to the wedding. Like, really. And then Jake thought the same thing. Everybody wants more. Errol, I can't be around Charlie or Glenn where they don't ask me, hey, man, you talk to Helwani. What's he doing? Everybody oh. uh, asks about you. I mean, it seems pretty clear that you left on very good terms. You burnt no bridges. And and here we are. I'm a little uncomfortable talking about it because I <laughs> missed working with you, but I'm still there. And, I, and so yeah. I, it's, I'm in a little bit of a tough spot, but I'll tell you this. You are, you are, uh, your absence is definitely noticed. First day on the job. And thank you for that. I'm not trying to give myself the old Barry Horowitz here. You know, it's really nice to hear that because I wasn't quite sure, but it's very nice to hear that. First day on the job, first hour into the job, I'm sitting there face to face with you, you're in Oregon, of course, and we're rehearsing for our show. I'm literally at my dream job and I'm sitting there doing the dance with you and we were together. You know, I kind of thought we would jump out of the plane together. I mean, there I am jumping the parachutes on, you're staying back, but nevertheless, <laughs> very happy to see you thrive. Can I just say, uh, you appear to be in fantastic shape, Chael. I mean, the veins popping out of your neck right now. Are we working out? What are we doing? Are we coming back? What's happening? No, I'm not coming back, but I, I have been working on it. I actually got offered a fight, Ariel, and, and I had to say no. You know, I don't fight anymore, so I yeah. had to say no to it. But that is the first time in my life I've been offered a fight and said no. It was going to be for a boxer. I apologize. A boxing match with an NFL guy whose last name is Gore. Frank Gore. Frank Gore. Is it Frank Gore? Okay, yeah. and that was going to be on this what is now Woodley versus Paul. I only bring that to you because, no, I have those fantasies like anybody. Abu Dhabi's coming up. I'm the super fight champion. I have those fantasies of going in and, and competing again, but I'm not putting the work in doing a lot of stuff on bench press. When COVID hit, I got myself right in my garage. I got a bench press. And I ordered a treadmill off of Craigslist. I do a lot of walking, more walking than running. And I hit the weights every now and then. And my son and daughter's there. It's kind of a family playful thing, which I think speaks to the lack of intensity that I'm putting out. I appreciate the compliment very much, but I think in truth, partner, I'm just wearing a tight shirt. It's a nice shirt. And let me tell you, one of the all time great, playgrounds you have in your house over there. I got a sneak peek one time at your workout area. I mean, can we talk about this? You've got like the pit in there. You've got the thing with the kids. They can fly in. This thing, this thing should be on, on, on TV shows. I don't know how you came up with this, but God bless your kids. They are very lucky for what this, uh, you know, what this setup is. It's incredible. You still have that, right? That's what you're referring to. 
Yeah, definitely. We call it the foam pit. And I do appreciate that credit you're giving me because as a father, and I'm sure you can relate, I do so many things thinking I'm going to be a hero. I'm going to be a superstar and they don't work. There's no excitement. There's no smiles. Ariel, this thing, and I'm talking every day, they have not got tired of it. We put this in one month before COVID hit. So it was perfect timing. The whole neighborhood was coming over. It's just a box. I just built a box and I went to Amazon and ordered uh, USA Gymnastics approved foam. So I threw the foam balls in. There's a platform and they go cannonball like it's a swimming pool. They hit their backflips in there and, and it's just a crash and burn. Not only do I feel as though they're getting some athleticism from it. They have the rings they have to climb. There's some strength building, some balance. But not only that, but they come home tired. And there's very few things that I want more in life than to send my kids somewhere where they learn a skill and they come home tired. I'm a wrestling coach. And when I have to pitch wrestling to parents, I tell them that you give me your kid. I will teach him a skill and I will give him back to you tired. It's a big bonus. I think you know what I'm talking about. Um, it's a massive bonus. You always want the kids to be tired. So they go to bed at the end of the night. This is so great. Chill. I mean, I kind of blew it. I should have started off with chill. I don't know if you know this, but this is the first time that we speak in six months on a show. Uh, you know, there's a lot of great memories there. I'm just having so much fun. Uh, by the way, um, and we'll go all over the place here, but I have a lot of things that I want to ask you about. Is Mean Street Coffee an actual thing that I can buy? Yes. Where can I get it? Yes, Mean Street Coffee is set up. We sell about three to six bags a day. I've never advertised it once. And Ryan and I just did an experiment. We wanted to know if signage is a real thing. Is signage a real thing for my little purposes? So we, we, we've we only stuck the sign up. I've never said the words. Nobody's asked me about it. And we sell about three to six bags a day. So, wow. yes, we're working on it. We got our own brewer in uh, Dana Point. That is a whole business uh, that I really didn't know was going to be uh, quite as complicated as it is. I thought you get some you get some beans and you ship it out to somebody. There's a few more steps to it. But, um, yeah, it's a real thing. I had some this morning. This morning. I mean, it sounds fantastic. I remember, of course, your little coffee things that you would put, you know, under your, you know, your lip over there, which I was always very envious of. Of course, never was offered one, but it would always been, you know, nice to have been offered at least once. Um, what about every Johnny come You're lately? talking about grinders. You're talking about grinders. Yes, it's a <laughs> coffee. I have one in right now, but you're supposed to put oh. it in under your lip and it's supposed to give you a caffeine burst. Like somewhere where you can't drink coffee, you put the grinders. And I heard about it from some baseball player. I spent $77 ordering these things online. And I'll be damned if I'm going to throw them out. But if I'm fair with you, I don't think they work. I think it's snake oil. I feel like I put it in my lip. I I play the part like I have an attitude uh, lift. I don't know if it's real. By the way, where are you? I have always loved this studio that you work out of. But it's like you got in a time machine and went right back to it. (laughs) Who who set this up for you? Okay, so I'm I'm doing this show. This is for Vox Media, VOX Media. This is in the heart of uh, downtown Manhattan next to the financial district. And uh, this was an amazing studio set up that I was, uh, you know, a small part in, in designing and coming up with the, the look for it in 2017. And I only got to ride this bicycle for a year before, you know, the opportunity to go work for, for ESPN. And uh, lo and behold, amazingly, they still kept it. They kept the thing. Wow. So, you know, it, it was here. They had to dust it off a little bit, but it's just as, you know, it, it always looked. And by the way, I don't know if you know this. You're right here, always in my heart. Your, your figurine is right here. And I don't know if the camera can catch it, but you're right here. You're right here. I look and we have you walking out. Always, uh, you're, you'll always be immortal. You're right here, right next to me. Hey, I appreciate that. And Errol, I don't know what cup I'm in, that the figurine. I don't know what cup I'm in, but it's a soccer that's team. like a team, a soccer team. Yeah, is that, Everton, is right? Everton. Everton. And I only tell you that because I got a DM in Twitter today that said, tell Ariel to get you out of that cup. <laughs> Everton has never won a game. It was something like that. And I don't know soccer well enough to know yes. if it's true, but I really did get that. I got that DM from a person who's watching us live right now. So there's the shout out. I love it. I love the fact that you're checking your DMs because didn't you famously one time get a DM from The Rock and not notice it for like a couple of years? Instagram. Instagram. It's, I don't do I'm a Twitter guy. I didn't oh. know about this Instagram stuff. And yeah, I'm name dropping for sure, but it's a big deal for me. I'm from a little town in Oregon. Like if you meet somebody who's on television, that's a big deal. We would all brag about that to each other and everybody would want to know the story. This is the this is the biggest guy on television. He sent me a beautiful post-career message. Kind of broke my career. He, he took some real time to set it and I blew him off. And I've I've always felt bad about that. When you wrote him back, eventually when you noticed it, did he write you back or did he leave you hanging? 
No, he left me hanging. He yeah. left me hanging completely. And I'll tell you one guy that's very good at writing back. Again, I'm name dropping. I know I am. But sure. Jeremy Piven. Remember Jeremy Piven? Of course. Who Ari played Gold. Ari on Ultra? He's very good. I, I don't know if he's just really disciplined or if he's a little bit bored right now. But I've never met him, and I can get a hold of him like this. I like that. Yeah, no, he's great. He's actually been on this program before. A couple months ago, we had him on. Um, all right, so a lot to get to, you, uh, get to with you. Uh, I want to ask you about Submission Underground. Uh, there was some rumors that were reported recently. Someone reported it. I don't remember who it was. Some jabron uh, reported that uh, new home for Shug coming in 2022, right? A new home for Submission Underground, That's the right. number one grappling organization on the planet, uh, founded and headed up by you. So what what could you tell us? What's What's going on with Submission Underground? Why are you leaving UFC Fight Pass? Well, I can tell you everything. Let me start with this. We haven't left Fight Pass yet. As a matter of fact, we have a show this Sunday. It's going to be a, a great card. Just to throw a name back from yesteryear, but Tara La Rosa is coming out in an absolute grudge match with Mercedes. They've had some real fun on social media. Uh, going to be a great time. Sean Strickland and Varela will go live on my YouTube page at 2.30 Pacific time. Get over to Fight Pass, 3 o'clock. We are, we are going to blow the doors off. And you are right. The contract has expired. And, you know, what do you call it now? We're free agents, and we're talking to a lot of people. But we're also talking to Fight Pass. The relationship uh, there is great. But this is the last one on the on the deal. That that is true. Wow, you got Sean Strickland. He's quite the. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar. He's he's quite the lightning rod in the sport right now. You got him to agree to compete. Ariel, you know good and well I would never bust a guy's character. Yeah. I hated when people were doing that to Colby Covington. It infuriated me. I hated when people did it to me. It's hard for me to not bust Sean's gimmick though. He is uh, going after the I'm crazy market. I don't even know if that is to market. I know Sean Strickland 10 years. I don't know if I've ever trusted a workout partner or teammate more than I trust Sean Strickland. I would put Sean Strickland as far, this will stun you, as a gentleman. Not just a nice guy, not just a good guy. I put him in a higher category. He's a great dude. He's going for something. It looks like it's working to some degree that there's a whole bunch of, hey, I'm a I'm a madman out there. Never seen anybody try this before. Didn't even know it was a market myself, but it's very hard for me to speak about him and act as though he's not working. He is working. And my experience, he's a great dude. Okay. Great to hear that. And I'm hesitant. Hey, I'm hesitant to defend him because of some of the things that he said. So I kind of, Sean, whatever it is you're doing, I'm going to sit back and just watch. I'm going to sit back and observe and just see if there, in fact, is a market for the I'm nuts crowd. But it's hard for me because he treated me so well. He continues to treat me so well. You know, I, I feel as though I, I can't just leave him out there. I, a number of people say things going for some gimmick and it gets recorded and comes out to the world. They wish they could run it back. I don't know if Sean's in that category yet, but I'm telling you from my experience, He's a good guy. One of the things that I love about Submission Underground is that you'll get the recognizable names from the world of MMA, like the Sean Stricklands. You've had Mike Perry and Ally Quint. I mean, the list goes to Tara La Rosa on this card. But, uh, I mean, we could sit here for 20 minutes and talk about the recognizable names. But you'll also get the recognizable names from the grappling world as well to compete. So it's kind of like this mix of two worlds. And sometimes you'll get fantasy matchups and all this stuff. Is there any concern that if you leave Fight Pass you won't be able to get those recognizable UFC names on the cards. Supposedly, that is not the case. Okay. Spoke to Dana White directly. Spoke to Scott Coker directly. They don't want guys kickboxing. They don't want guys boxing. They like grappling. They support grappling. That's always been the universal field. And no, I don't think the carpet's going to get pulled out. But I hear you. That is a real concern. It's a reason I made uh, those phone calls because you want to be very respectful. I actually don't know why Dana and Coker allow their athletes to go and, and and do other shows. I don't know if I was in their spot that I would allow it, but that has always been the policy of the bosses. And they've both had that policy and they've never flinched. I believe that that's going to say, I'll tell you what, we made a mistake too. There was a theory going around at one point that if you take a top MMA guy and you put him with a top grappler, that there's really something to see. And that did, that was a ball of fire, but it died out after about three months. We're seeing a lot better traction in terms of the needle moving, taking a top MMA guy, Against the top MMA guy, but just yeah. having him compete under grappling rules. So we're going to a little bit more of that. Sean Strickland specifically in this case wants Andy Varela because Sean is getting ready uh, for Jack Hermanson. And he just thinks it'd be a good workout and good practice. So we're going to get to see that contest. How many events in 2022 slated for right now? Ten events. Ten events. When do you think you'll find the uh, the new home for the promotion? Well, I think we have pretty good talks right now. But, I mean, again, Fight Pass is still at the table, and I'm hesitant. 
there, there's no yeah, hard when feelings. I say new home, maybe new deal, I guess sure. I should say. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, this is the game that you play, sure. right? We came in a fight pass. We, we can do really great things. We can get you recognition. We can get Errol Hawani talking about you. And yes, I actually said that they kind of said, well, prove it. So after we went out and proved it, now the game that we're playing is we're going to do it for what we agreed to. Once it's time uh, and that's up, then we get to come back and we get to turn the gun on you in all fairness. And that's just, it's a game, right? We're playing yeah. a game of chess. Whoever would like it, Submission Underground is going to be put on 10 shows. If that works for you, call me. If it doesn't, don't. Okay. I mean, there's no shortage of streaming platforms right now. By the way, I love seeing you do the old pick up your leg and cross your legs. I mean, this is, I mean, this is nostalgia just dripping off me right now. It's a beautiful thing. I miss that. I truly miss that. Now, the other thing I wanted to ask you about was the fact that you have this YouTube channel, and I think it's brilliant that you're going to put that match on your YouTube channel because your YouTube channel is killing it. Now, Chael... Every Johnny come lately coming out of retirement now is like, oh, I'm going to do a YouTube channel too. Yeah, I'm talking about you, DC. Yeah, I'm talking about you, Michael Bisping, and so many others. How do you feel about all these guys copying your gimmick? Well, I, I am going to take the credit for that, right? I, I mean, they say imitation is the greatest form of flattery. We all used to try to copy Joe Rogan, but Joe does something very specific. First off, his Rolodex is beautiful. And second, he does a three-hour show. I mean, he kind of does what you do where he can really go a long time. So, yeah, I am the one that sharded the shorter clips, and they are following uh, my model, but there's definitely enough to go around. And I think Bisping does an awesome job. Bisping is a bigger star than people realize. He's a big deal in North America. He is so big in England, it's shocking. There is not a British fighter who does not look up to Michael Bisping. He sold out some arena over there. And then I like what DC is doing. DC is doing that right from his hotel room, right after the show. So he's very prompt. He gets the content out quickly. Competition makes us all better, and they might have stolen from me, but I'm having to compete right back. Believe me, I have upped my game because of that. Oh, yeah? In what respect? Well, timeliness is a huge deal. Uh, this actually came from you. I had an interview with Ben Askren after a fight, and I did about 80,000 views. Not a terrible number. You did the same interview, but you did it a day before me, and you had 800,000 views. So Ryan and I had just seen the importance of getting out to the market quickly. Like, I'm going to the pay-per-view this weekend, but we've got a separate hotel room that we will turn into a studio, and the moment the show's over, boom, we'll be there. But we're competing against Daniel, who's found a way with technology to get this out very quick, Bisping, who's always consistent with a recap. Being first is really important. It's hard to do. It's a game. Yeah. But we're consistent. And we're we're going to play the game. Now, uh, there, like, uh, without getting too deep, there's real money to be made here, right? Like, people don't realize. There's a reason why you guys are so active on there. You can make a real significant living doing these videos on YouTube, but with not much else, right? Literally from that set that you're on right over there. You can make some, I mean, look, you can make a legit living, right? Sure. Th that is very true. And I think a lot of people get turned off by YouTube. I was one of those people. When you hear what you get, it's called a CPM. But how much money you get paid per click? I mean, we're talking about fractions of a penny. But to your point, if you do, I do right around 20 million of those fractions per month. And yes, over time, it can add up. You get, you can then come in sponsorship opportunities. Once you cross half a million subscribers, put YouTube puts you into a category. Once you cross a million, which I haven't yet, I'm just short of that. Supposedly, we go into yet uh, another uh, mechanism within the algorithm. So yes, there is some opportunity there. You get, you're going to work pretty hard. You're going to be in one of these studios quite a bit. But sure, are you asking me, is, is there a payoff? There, there can be, yes. I love it. One guy who's made you know, quite a bit of coin off of YouTube, check out this trend. I mean, this is a transition right here, Chael. I mean, this is some Jake Paul, right? I mean, there you go, Jake Paul, right? You see that? You, I saw on your YouTube channel, huge mistake, you said, to fight Tyron Woodley on two weeks' notice. Why is this a mistake? I think it is. And don't forget, this mistake is what I respect about it so much. This is a real fighter move. And Jake Paul has been resisted by our community for reasons that I don't fully understand. And this is common, Ariel. This has happened with announcers, just to use recent examples. But Todd Grisham, who did a damn good job, was resisted. Stephen A. Smith, who came over, gave us a whole level of... He was resisted. There's something that the MMA community specifically wants before they welcome you into the club. And people pushed back on Jake because of the Disney, because of the YouTube, because he acted corny for so long. But the truth is, this is a real fighter move. He has nothing to gain here. But this is a very big risk. 
There is nothing that can help you more in a fight than not having dwelled on the fight for a training camp. If you're in pretty good shape and you get that last minute call, I could tell you a number of athletes where the big upsets come. When we're talking about Bisping a moment ago, not only was Bisping in that spot where he had a clear mind, it's not just a clear body where you're peaking. Your mind is clear. You didn't know what was going to happen. This is a huge risk by Jake, not to mention what a cool spot for Tyron Woodley. Tyron Woodley's going to make more money this year or at least the same money as he did in his prime. And that wasn't expected. That's not what guys who uh, leave the UFC have to look forward to. So Tyron's a bit of an inspiration in that regard. And if Tyron beats him, you can bet your ass they're going to go to part three, which would be even bigger. Jake Paul does not need this fight. However, there's 20 other men and women on that card whose Christmas will be ruined, whose holidays will be ruined if they don't get to go out there and compete. And Jake Paul followed the golden rule of show business, which is the show must go on. And that is a gangster move. And he deserves credit for it. I really respect I think he's up against it. I think he really is. And I think that Tyra has gone to bed every single night thinking about Jake Paul, praying on his hands and knees that this opportunity comes. I think that Tyron's in a very good spot. That's how I'll word it. Wow. They need to clip that off and use that as part of the promotion for the fight. That's a tremendous way to sell the fight. True or false, in your opinion, do we see Jake Paul versus Nathan Diaz in 2022? In 2022 might be a little bit quick, right? I mean, Nate has, I only know, what you know that we've all been told, which is Nate has one fight left on his contract. He would like to exhaust that contract so that he can go and fight Paul, which by the way, would be a massive fight. and will have nothing to do with the outcome of Nate's next fight in the UFC. There's only a few athletes where the result of their last contest does not matter moving forward. But if you look at them, it's also the three biggest stars in the sport, Conor McGregor, George Mosbrough, anybody with the last name of Diaz all have one thing in common, which is they have not won their last fight. They haven't won their last Two fights, but they're still at the top of the bill. It's one of those things where Nate has a hardcore and loyal audience. He brings us along for the journey. We're going to follow him wherever he goes. He's in a very unique and special spot that only two other guys, Connor and uh, Jorge, are in. I think he needs to play that card wisely. I don't think he should shy away from the Chemayevs or anybody else. If the goal is one thing, it's not to become a contender. It's not to become a champion. It's to get done with your contract. I would suggest go get done with the contract. Fair. But don't you think that if he fights a Shemaev and loses that fight and gets dominated in that fight, he loses leverage, right? There's less of an interest in seeing him fight anyone, let alone a Jake Paul. It's definitely better to win than lose if that's what you're asking me. But I'll go back to the example I just made, which is the sport's three biggest stars all have in common. They didn't win their last fight. They didn't even win their fight before that. And I just think that Nate has an innate ability. Look, if Chamayo tackles him and pounds him out, Nate's quickly going to flip the script to you tackled me like a sissy. Why don't you stand up with me like a man? And he's going to build the story right into boxing. That's what I suggest. Of course, it's better to have a victory or even if you lose to lose closely Nate gained a lot of and saved a lot of face just by hurting Leon in that final round. So many people said, well, if there was 20 seconds left, Nate would have finished him. I just bring that to you because Nate has something special. Nate has an ability to monetize more than just the punches and the kicks. Every fighter could only monetize, and his only commodity is the performance. Nate offers something else, which is the entertainment outside of it. It's the same thing that Connor has. It's the same thing Mosbrough has. It's the reason that we, the fan, I'm a Nate fan, man. I'm coming along whether he beats Jemayev or not. I do want to circle back to something you said at the very beginning because I wanted to have that nice little moment with you selfishly, but come on. This Hamza Chemayev, Neil Magny situation, I said earlier, maybe one of the most bizarre that I've ever seen. You got the guy who's ranked 11 going up there and saying, hey, I can't find anyone to fight. You got Dana White saying, we can't find anyone for him to fight. And you have literally number seven. It's not 11 wanting to fight seven. You have seven wanting to go backwards and fight 11 who is arguably one of the scariest guys in the sport, say, pick me, I'm right here. And they're like, is anyone there? I don't get this. And I also don't get it because I feel like it's an appropriate fight, not just from a ranking standpoint, from a style standpoint. You get by Neil Magny, now you're talking about top five. It all makes sense. And it's not like Neil Magny is some kind of boogeyman. I mean, not that long ago, Michael Chiesa beat him. What do you make of this situation? Why does it seem like they are doing everything in their power not to book this fight? Errol, the answer is right in front of us, but we're not seeing it. I'm the same as you. I've got the wrong glasses on. I'm wearing a pair of glasses that Shemayev can't get anybody to fight him. Shemayev is calling guys out left and right. And Shemayev's call-outs, by the way, aren't just call-outs. He is exposing 
people. He is exposing who the competitors are and who the guys that are playing the game are. I appreciate it to one degree, but the other side of it is the buck stops somewhere. And it has clearly stopped at Neil Magny. And Neil Magny's call out is nothing like Jeff Neal's or even Blahal Mohammed's, who said, we'll do the fight. We'll do the fight versus I want the fight are very different. Neil Magny, when he did the call out, by the way, laid out a case. He said, one year ago, I was offered this fight. One year ago, I accepted this fight. COVID hit. Things got delayed. I'm still here. I'm still standing. I'm in the same weight class. Let's do I mean, Neil Magny is very serious about wanting the fight. Agreeing to do a fight versus wanting a fight are very different. And there's only one guy, one guy who wants the fight. It's Neil Magny. So I'm with you, Errol. I'm looking past the, something. Something isn't here, whether that's a contract or I, I'm not sure. That fight makes a lot of sense. By the way, I really would like to see that fight. There's plenty of questions still around Chimaev. I happen to be on the hype train. I happen to think that it's very special. That he's had four fights, two in, in two different weight classes. Nobody leaves the first round. Only one strike's been landed. Like those numbers really do mean something, but I need to know how he can do in the third round. I need to know once he gets a busted nose, can he push through it? I hear great things from the gym, but I want to see them. And Neil Magny is going to – Neil Magny's getting out of the first round. I think that you and I can agree on. Yeah, and that's why I want to see it. Now, Neil Magny's chill. a problem, bro. He is. He's the scariest guy in the UFC. He's the most feared man yep. in the UFC. He needs to put that on a T-shirt right now and play this up. Now, Chael – when we launched our critically acclaimed program, Ariel and the Bad Guy, I mean, we helped, of course, build ESPN Plus with our hands off our shoulders. One of the first people, yes, thank you, one of the first people to put us over, uh, lest we forget, was one Conor McGregor. Remember, he tweeted about us very early on and said he was enjoying the program. How he was watching it from international uh, locales, I have no idea, but nevertheless, we took the compliment and ran with it. Now, I log on Twitter and I see you guys going back and forth. I see, I'm like, what happened here? What I thought we got, I thought we were on the same team. I thought we were all friends. What happened? Why the, uh, why the dissolve of the friendship here? I, I, I'm not ready to admit it. I think that Connor looks up to me. I treat Connor like he's a little brother, and I think he looks up to me. I could be a fool. If he does not think, okay, Chael was my mentor at some point in this career, and I'm out defending him left and right like I am, I'm a fool. And that is an option that's on the table. Connor has never broke bad on me publicly before. It irritated me. He did it this time. I said what I just said, which is as candid and plainly as I know how to speak. And I said, stop and stop now. And he did. Now, I took that as a sign of respect. Maybe he just had other things to do and didn't even know that I said that. It was purely coincidence. I'm going to need to talk with Connor and see where, where we stand, because if there's a fight going on here, I'm going to fight back. And he will remember why he looked to me in the first place. But if it was a misunderstanding, he thought I said something, he needed to defend himself, all good. But you feel like he crossed the line. I did not appreciate, very much so, I did not appreciate that he did that publicly, yes. And I, there's not a whole lot of things that would hurt my feelings. Everybody wants to talk about, oh, I got thick skin and I condition, I can take it. I think I'm that guy for the most part, but there was something specifically about when he did it because of our relationship. Yeah, it bothered me. Oh, really? Okay, so he went personal. He's just never treat. He's never done that to me. Yeah. I've been a long time defender, and that puts me in a very hard spot sometimes. I defended the DM comment against Poirier. I suggested for the audience, maybe we see Connor being a jerk. Maybe that's true, and he got exposed. Or maybe we see an entertainer who, while even down and injured, is going to continue to entertain the fans until the final credit rolls. I have the only one that has told the story straight about the night Connor whipped Floyd Mayweather's ass. Now, I know that Floyd kicked his butt right back, but the Nevada State Athletic Commission did not give a single round to Connor McGregor. Teddy Atlas gave four to Connor McGregor. Who do you want to trust? The hidden names of the crooked Nevada State Athletic Commission or the respected Teddy Atlas? I only bring that to you because I've done a good job of telling the story, and Connor's put me in some pretty hard spots. His name has been out there a lot of times. I just don't know that we're seeing a genuine jerk. I believe we're seeing a genuine and committed performer. Mm. So I've always told that side of it. I've always thought that he knew and appreciated it, but I could be wrong here. I could be sitting here a fool right now. He here, Chael thinks I look up to him. Ha ha ha. Well, that would hurt my feelings. It would also teach me something because yes, that is what I think. Now, the last time we spoke was in June publicly. So we haven't talked like since his loss to Poirier, the second one and all that stuff. Do you think he ever fights for a belt again? 
No, I don't think so. I, I really don't. Look, if, if you ever have a number one guy and he slides down to number four, he slides down to number five, he's never getting his spot back. And that's across the board in sport. Now, Connor has already done, much like John Jones and fairness. He's already done a lot of things that no other man can do. So I'm very open to the idea. I just know that Connor lost a level of discipline. It appeared when he got uh, to a different position in life, to a different status. It looked like he lost some discipline from where I was sitting. Now it's not a choice, Ariel. It was a choice to go to the gym and train hard back when he was healthy and he didn't do enough of it. Now it's not a choice. And I can tell you no human being can get better at something by not doing it. I think that Connor is still wonderful. I think he's got a very special place, not only within the sport, which is at the very top, but also within the rankings. This is a damn good fighter. But your time at a 55-pounder, which is the hardest and deepest division the sport has ever seen, not just the organization, the industry as a whole, 155 is the deepest that it comes. And if you do talk about, you know, Connor's pre pretty set on fighting Dustin Poirier. If Poirier beats Oliveira, as the odds makers think he's going to do, I don't think there's a scenario where Connor comes back even for a grudge match into a title fight. That's a tough sell. Would you agree? Yeah, no, it is a tough sell. By the way, I was going to ask you, do you, do you agree with them? Have you made your official pick yet? Yeah. Do you agree with the odds makers? I, you think Dustin wins? I am picking Dustin. I'm not bullish on that. He's going to lose a lot of this fight. He's going to lose exchanges. If Dustin gets taken down and Poirier did, uh, I apologize, Oliver did show us a brand new skill set in his fight with Tony Ferguson, which was to walk him to the cage, get to that double, never miss. He shot five shots in that fight. He got five takedowns. That's meaningful because I didn't know the wrestling uh, of Oliver was quite that good. And if he does get on top of Poirier or anybody else, they are likely to stay for the duration of the round and lose said round. So Poirier really needs to get it done on his feet. And that's not just with the kicks of the knees and the elbows, it's specifically with left and right hands. And I don't, I think Oliver is a lot better than people give him credit. He's inconsistent, at least compared to Poirier. Th this fight could go either way. You're asking me, I'm putting the curse on Poirier, but boy, this is, it's a lot harder fight than people know. And so is the women's fight. Juliana Pena is a live dog. Uh, I do want to ask you about Amanda Nunes in a second, but just while we're talking about European fighters, Conor McGregor, it reminded me of this amazing... By the way, we still have some time here. Do you got a heart out? Was, I mean, I'm enjoying this so much. I mean, this is so much fun. This is beautiful. There's a young man who... I think his name is like Ottman or something. This young guy who looked up to you many moons ago, would write you all the time on Twitter. You slide in the DMs. You wish him the best. Now he's becoming a fighter in his own right, and you have stayed in contact. This is a beautiful story, and I think it speaks to your heart, Shale. Can you tell us the story? You, you've got it right there. He's actually the city reigning uh, Cage Warriors champion. He's doing a great job. And the UFC, I mean, Cage Warriors is a fantastic feeder program. Ever bit the feeder program that the LFA is right into the UFC. And this guy's on, I'm not sure that he's lost. If I have that uh, wrong, he's got one loss, but he's the sitting champion. He's got a ton of fans. People are watching him. And he said something very nice to me. The story that you just told, he said that. He said a number of years ago when he was an aspiring fighter, I believe he said he was 14, but that we communicated uh, on Twitter through DM. And that, that gave him a little bit of a boost. And if you can find motivation as an athlete, it's hard to do. So if, if I helped to do that is a big compliment. It made me feel wonderful to hear him say that the kid's tougher in hell. And I can't wait to help promote him on the next stage because I believe he will be in the UFC. That's amazing. I love that. I love that little friendship and uh, that you're sticking with him and propping him up as much as possible. Amanda Nunes to me is obviously one of the best fighters in UFC history, regardless of gender. I also think... It's one of the, I want to use my words wisely here, Chell, and I think you will agree with me. It's one of the biggest mishaps in MMA history, the way in which she has dealt with her career. She does no media. She does nothing to promote herself. Amanda Nunes could be a much, much, much bigger style star excuse me, than she is. She isn't the draw that she should be because she doesn't she doesn't do any interviews. She doesn't do media unless it's fight week and she has to. She does nothing to sell herself. She's one of the great, look at her resume. Look at the list of people that she has been from Misha Tate to Ronda Rousey to, to, to Holly Holm to Chris freaking Cyborg. The list goes on and on. She is the greatest female fighter of all time. And yet I feel like she is one tenth as famous and as rich and as powerful in this game than she should be. Am I off? It's frustrating. What do you think? As someone who promoted... Reality. 
What do you mean? Era, who, whoever's advising her or not offering these opportunities, it's a game of profession, uh, perception versus reality in this regard. The perception of Amanda is not the reality. The perception that she is stone cold, the perception that she is vicious, and then you meet her. She's amongst the sweetest girls. And people say that same thing about Cyborg. It's true. Mm -hmm. These girls aren't what you see on TV. They're very nice. They're very thoughtful. They care about their families. They treat people right. All the stuff that you wouldn't think a dirty rotten cage fighter does. So many people have taken the Brock Lesnar approach, which is monsters don't speak. Let the perception live. That's going to get her further. I disagree. I see it the way you do. I think that soft side of her. I think that loving wife and mother of her. I think those things work. I think they sell the way her teammates and coaches speak about her, her loyalty, her honesty, her integrity. I think these things are important and she could only get that message out by doing interviews and coming to the audience. But when you hear her speak the first time, it is very different than what you thought you were going to get. And from a marketing standpoint, that puts some of the experts in a tough position. I think they have made the wrong decision, which is to not have her out there. I think people would love to know the things that I just said. And moreover, hear it from her, not from me and you. Yeah. I, I just think it's a, it's, it's a big fumble what they're doing because she could be, I mean, you literally have the greatest of all time and I feel like no one knows who she is outside of the bubble. Of course, in the bubble, we know who she is outside. We don't, you think we'll see Kayla Harrison versus Amanda Nunes? That's the fight to make, right? That's the biggest fight for both fighters. What a story would be. I don't feel like we're going to see it anytime soon. If ever, what do you think? For us hardcores, yes, I, I, for sure, that's the fight to make, or even Kayla versus Cyborg, but Kayla being challenged, we'd like to see. Look, Kayla's got one big problem, which is she's at 155 pounds, and Kayla said herself, the last time I weighed 145, I was a junior in high school. Now, there was a test run through Invicta where Kayla was supposed to go to 145, so if I'm not checking uh, my notes here clear, clear enough, perhaps that happened, but it I did. thought it got pulled at the last No, it did, it did. And she that did match it. didn't happen. It happened she late did. last she, year. She, she made it. Yeah, she made it. And that's important, Errol. If she can get to the weight class, that's very important. You'll remember when that kept Cyborg out. Tito was manager and said she would die if she made the weight. If she's proven that she can do it, I think that's very helpful in her case. It is a one-off situation, and it's for the hardcores. I, I don't know that other people would know all about it. I certainly do, and I would love to see it. And I also love the story that they were training partners. And according to Kayla, Amanda, over a year ago, told the coaches I'm not working out with her anymore because how well Kayla was doing and the potential and the promise that Amanda could feel knowing that competition could be down the road. That's a big statement to say about your teammate, which by the way, was not denied. Mm. Amanda did not speak on it, but she did not deny it. The coaches did not speak on it, but they did not deny it. And that tells me something. If Amanda has felt what she thinks could be her kryptonite, even in training, I would find that interesting. And I'd like to know. You know, Chell, back in 1997, November of 1997, we had the Montreal screw job. I was in attendance over there at the uh, Molson Center in Montreal when the, the great right Bret call. Hart. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> How can you say that? How can you say that? How can you say it was the right call? Why? Because you didn't want to drop the title? Yes, it was Vince's belt. Take it off the son of a bitch. He doesn't owe him anything. He doesn't you live with, leave it with him. It's Vince's belt. He wanted Take to lose your damn belt back. Next night, next night on Raw, he wanted to lose it. He want to lose it in Canada. Yeah, but I, that story is falling apart over time. He didn't want to lose him to Canada. That's true. But supposedly the next night, he was going to show up to Nitro with the belt. No, he's not that And he had, disclosed this, he had disclosed this to Vince. This story. I mean, these are all stories. None of us know everything. Even Shawn Michaels has now ran it back and said, look, I knew the whole time. And this story has changed. It's been pretty fluid. So you got to choose what you believe. But I choose to believe that Vince helped him get the $3 million deal with WCW, that Vince was an advocate. And one, one way to help Ted Turner and, and Eric Bischoff bleed that money out was the promise that Brett could show up the next night with the belt over his shoulder. He got the $3 million deal. And at the last minute, Vince said, man, I can't let you do it. And he took the belt off the guy. Brett didn't want to be a team player. Brett thinks wrestling is real. Brett thinks he was truly a five-time world champion. More power to him, but that's not the case. This is a show, and I write the script, and you're going to do it my way if I'm handing you the check, or I'm going to give you a screw job. It was the right decision. I couldn't disagree more. I'm just wondering, are, and now you've got me on a whole other tangent. That's not where I'm going with this question, but uh, are you watching these days, wrestling? You enjoying it? Interesting time, right? 
I follow it. I follow it very closely where I could talk it with you. I know about the ratings and yeah, I know yeah. that there's a fight with <laughs> AEW and Vince has laid down and said, go ahead and win it. And Vince is still winning it. I know everything that's going on because I listen to the Jim Cornette show. Uh, Jim Cornette does a three hour show every week where he recaps both products. So no, I don't watch the wrestling, but I listen to Jim Cornette. I am up to speed. Okay. All right. I was just curious if you and, were hey, by the way, by the way, what a reception CM Punk got, huh? Yeah. That was awesome. I know that was Chicago, but that was awesome. No wrestler knows when they're gone, if they come back, how they'll be received. I was so happy for Punk. No, yeah, it was great. I mean, I love what they're doing. I I, I love the competition. The reason I brought up the screw job was, because I'd be remiss if I don't mention this, because we debated this man for many years. Uh, I feel like we're about to see the old uh, Birmingham screw job here with our friend Leon Edwards. Is he really not going to get a title shot? What do you think? I mean, you can't do that to Leon, right? Poor Leon, right? I think he is. I'm mean, hearing differently. I, I, I think that he is going to get it only because it matches up. Yeah. I don't know how badly Usman wants to fight him. I'm putting myself in Usman's shoes. If I'm the top guy in the world, I would like to spread it around just a little bit. That's where like a a, a Luke would look very appealing it, for me. If I was Kamara, I don't know that Kamara needs to beat everybody and then go beat them all again. On the other side of it. We can't take away from Leon. He most certainly does deserve it. He was willing to do the heavy lifting against Masvidal. They say it's the thought that counts in life, and I personally subscribe to that. He had the right thought. He had the idea. I think you got to give him the uh, title opportunity. Okay, good. I'm happy we agree on this. Um, what are you hearing, though, partner? This is, you kind of threw me off there. Are you hearing that he's not going to get it? Because I haven't heard that yet. Okay, so uh, a comment was made by Dana White in his interview with uh, Jim Rome last week, your old pal, and uh, okay. which, by the way, I think I I think I beat you in the smack off a couple of years ago on Jim Rome, and then you didn't okay. come back. Yeah, it was nice. Um, where he said that he had something for Usman, and then excuse me for Leon, and uh, and everyone got very worried that uh, he was getting the old screw job. But after some digging, I haven't been told a hundred percent. Nothing's a hundred percent until the contracts are signed. I still feel like they're going in that direction for early ish spring. Um, there's no one else. And honestly, if sure. they if they don't go in that direction, I mean, if I'm Leon Edwards, I say I, I want out. Like, there's nothing more that this guy can do, unbeaten in 10 fights. Last loss was to Usman in 2015 before he was champion on a prelim of a Fox card. Like, you got to make the fight. There's literally no one else. They've tried. They're going to try to say to, uh, to Leon, okay, if you go on the Ultimate Fighter, then do the Real World World Rules Challenge, then go on WWE, then climb the Empire State Building, then we'll give you the title shot. Enough already. Just give the guy the damn title shot. Let's see if he's worthy of being champion, and let's move on. There's no one else out there. So I was wondering if you, because I had a feeling maybe you'd want to give him the old screw job, but it seems as though you finally come around on old Leon. And by the way, I love the way you set that up in the Empire States. But that, that was very good work by you. If you hear me steal that and use that Please. later, all right, I'm not going to give you credit. This is the credit, right? Would, be, would it be the but first I time? That. I would. Yeah, that's right. I would. I would use what you just laid out to strengthen our initial premise that it should be Magni versus Chemayev. If you were going to give Chemayev Leon who at that time was ranked number three in the world, and Chemayev was undefeated but was not ranked at all. If we could find a way to make that happen, then it would seem to me with Leon gone, it even strengthens Magni, who's not ranked as high, isn't on the same win streak. It seems it would strengthen Magni's position. I would like to know if that's being talked about or we just got a contract dispute, if the organization is looking into it but getting their ducks in a row before they call the guys – Generally, we can guess as an audience, right? Generally in MMA, where there's smoke, there is fire. There's something missing here. It's very unlike the organization. So I want to see it. I got to know everything. This is how I learn. I study these things and I learn. I'm going to learn something here, but Air, I, I'm not seeing it yet. It Magni, Chemayev, come on. You and I should be able to announce that right now. It, it makes too much sense. It's very strange. I can't quite figure this one out. Um, before I let you go, uh, you, you, and, you and John, I hear you guys are getting... A little bit closer. The uh, the fences are being mended. Yes, no. John Jones. Yeah. No. <laughs> this was me just throwing it down the middle for you. Just down it, like but he's training with Henry Cejudo now. From, the last I heard from John Jones was through text message via emoji of a giant middle finger, <laughs> which, by the way, by the way, he skin toned it, and I laughed. It was great. Clayton Hires does that too. When he sends me the fist, they take the, t and I love it. And I laughed when John did it. Uh, no, I am still upset and annoyed with John. I think he would be at me too, but that doesn't mean I can't stand back and acknowledge John's a pretty funny guy. I got a lot of John Jones stories. 
where he's been humorous. I told you he mooned my mother in a hotel. I mean, so he he's a funny guy. It'd probably be better if we did get along. But no, to answer your question, we don't. Wait a second. I don't know about the mooning of uh, Mrs. Sonnen in the hotel. I, what? Oh, my goodness. This was great. So John and I fight in New Jersey. And we get done about two o'clock from the arena. The fight ends at one o'clock. Then I got to get stitches. Then there's a post-fight press call. So it's two o'clock. It's a late night. I've got to be in the lobby at six o'clock the next morning to meet my mother, to get to the airport, to fly back to Portland. So John was up around the clock. And when I get to uh, my mother in the lobby of the hotel at 6 a.m., there's only my mother and John Jones there. And John is wearing nothing but red sweatpants. He's got no shirt, no hat, no shoes, no I mean, When I say nothing, he's wearing nothing but red sweatpants, and he's visiting with her, and he's being very polite. John excuses himself. My mother and I get our bags, and we're going to go. John takes the elevator up, then he walks out. It was one of those hotels where the doors are on the outside so you can see everything, and John yells down to her one last time to get her to look up, dropped his pants, mooned her, went into his room, and went to sleep. She loved it. By the way, some people think that's rude. My mother loved it. She bragged about that to her Bunko group. She put a, a message on Facebook. She still laughs about that to this day. Oh. So I don't want to hear people say that John was inappropriate. It was a funny move. It's up to my mother to decide. She liked it. Wow. God bless Claudia for uh, for thinking that that is funny. I would be very upset. By the way, why the middle finger? What prompted that? Really, you guys don't do mooning. See, mooning, mooning is geographical. No. I'm from the country. That's a country move. We used to do that. We pull up to somebody in traffic and you put your butt on the window and flash your cousin or something like this. Like I've seen mooning. No, my mom liked it. I'm a little surprised that you'd be no, disappointed. The middle finger. East Coast. I offered him a match. It was a grappling match, and I had two for him. One was against Rampage or against Tito. And this was X amount of time ago. And I think maybe I even threw a Stipe in there at some point, but I was making him the presentation. Here's what we'll do. Here's what you do. That's what he responded. Wow. Recently? Yeah. Eh, no, probably not. Probably about a year ago. That's not that but, long ago. You know, somewhat recently. Yeah, it was first submission underground. And uh, he was communicated, though. I mean, he did want to do the match. He went around me and went to the matchmaker. But doing business with John is not as hard as you might think. If John tells you he'll do something, he will do it. I got to give him that. Wow. That is fascinating. All right. Um, well, not only do you have Submission Underground this Sunday after UFC 269, the potential, I will say, potential last hurrah and fight pass. Of course, you can re-sign with them, and this will all be for not all the stuff that we talked about. Um, this Sunday at 2 p.m. Eastern, you said? 2 p.m. Pacific. 2.30. 2.30 Pacific time okay. on my YouTube, Sean Strickland versus Andy Varela, 3 o'clock Pacific time, live on Fight Pass. Now, I also want to mention that you are hosting the World MMA Awards on Friday night. And how about this? This is very exciting. I believe it starts at uh, 10.30 Eastern time, if I have that correct, on ESPN Plus, on the platform yes. we built. I believe it's the first time that it airs live on ESPN Plus, also on TSN in Canada, Tape Delay, CBS, and NBC. But this is pretty big. ESPN Plus airing the World MMA Awards this Friday? It's great news for them, Errol. I've hosted the award show before. It was like 2012, 2013, somewhere along these lines. And Errol, not only was it not on the worldwide leader, it was tape delayed. Yeah. It came on at like one in the morning, a month later on some network that nobody watched. I mean, it was one of these really hard things. And the folks at Fighters Only who have stayed with this, found a way, grounded out. Props to them, man, because they've made it. They're on ESPN and they're live now. Does that mean you're going to be the one who will hand me my 11-time Journalist of the Year award on Friday? Yes. I believe uh, – you would know, not me, but I believe you've won at 11. This would be 12. Do I have that wrong? Uh, no, 10. 10, time, 10, 11? Yeah, 10 going for 11. And I, I don't know the results. Of course. So if, if I was just trying win to it, I'm not giving you a spoiler. Yeah, I find out live up there, but you are nominated. That's true. Yeah, uh, we got MMA Fighting nominated. If you can give us a wink, wink, nudge, nudge, let us know if we won over here at MMA Fighting. I think we would appreciate that. No? Okay, nothing. Um, but yes, a lot going on. So you'll be out there. You'll be hosting that. You got Submission Underground. I mean, life seems to be. You got the show, of course, on ESPN+. Plus. The Chael Sonnen Show with George Sedano. I mean, it, it, the YouTube channel. Life is good. I mean, I thought maybe you'd get held back a little bit. You wouldn't get opportunities. You wouldn't progress since my departure, but it feels as though you've leveled up. Like you don't miss me all that and much. I, and I got a hot ass wife. All right. That's I mean, you're reading my resume and put me over. Don't forget about miss Brittany. The greatest thing that ever happened to me. 
Oh my God. Amen. And beautiful children as well. I'll end with this, Chael. The last time I saw you in person, do you remember when it was? In person? Oh, geez. I, I think it would have been at a T-Mobile arena for something, but no, I don't, I don't recall what fight. Clearly this moment didn't mean as much to you as it did to me. The last time I saw you in person was March of 2020, Israel Adesanya. Remember, you have to pronounce it correctly, Adesanya. Arizona. Yep. Yeah. Uh, nope, not Arizona. March of 2020 in Las Vegas, T-Mobile Arena against Yoel Romero. Also, Joanna and Jacek and Zhang Weili. That's the last time we saw each other in person, right before the pandemic. Do you remember that? I do now. That surprises me. I had not realized what my time went by. But Aaron, I'm sure you can relate, and so can the viewers. This whole last year has been a little bit of a blur with how fluid the situation is. I, I wish I do recall that. I remember the great time that we had there, and I apologize. The reason I bring this up, the reason I'm telling this story, is because I've said this story on the show. Actually, my first day back, I think I said this story. And I've repeated the story, and I get very emotional when I tell this story, and I hope I don't get emotional again. But I tell this story to explain to people how special of a human being you are and how great of a friend you have been to me. And I, you, don't, you may not even know that this meant so much to me, but as you may recall, there were some issues, and I couldn't, as we were driving to the arena on that Saturday afternoon, I hope I'm not putting you in an awkward spot right now, I was told that I could not go in with the team, that I had to go through a side entrance to get to the top. It was a whole big to-do, and it was very, very stupid and petty. And everyone got out of the van, as they should have, and I don't blame anyone for doing that, except you. And you said that you were going to go in there with me wherever I was going in from. And that just meant the world to me, and it, it, uh, it just showed your loyalty to me and uh, your friendship towards me. And I'll never forget that for as long as I live, the fact that you stayed in the car and uh, stayed by my side as I had to feel very embarrassed that I had to go through all of this and ashamed that I had to go through all of this. The fact that you did that, uh, I mean, you, you, you've called me partner over the years and that was the true definition of partner. And so I miss those moments where we get to sit in the back and have the chachuterie and watch the fights together and hope that no one bothers us so we could just watch and talk about the fights together. I, uh, I miss working with you. I loved every second of it. And hopefully one day down the line, we could do it again. I must tell you, thank you for having me on. That's a beautiful story, and I would do it again. Band of Brothers, watch it sometime. Now, I wish that you can slam the computer right now and say kaboom, but you're from this fancy set, and you can't do that. I do feel like this interview is dragging on just a little bit. I mean, I think what? we should probably jump up at some point, this and if it. I had that laptop capability, I would have slammed it down. I mean, in all fairness, wrap it up. Yeah, this is, good here. This is me. This is me trying to wrap it up, but I like when you wrap it up. Hang on. Just hang up on right, Goodbye, Errol. Okay, bye-bye. There he is. Let's wait. There it is. Okay. <laughs> I was waiting for him, you know, to slam it, and uh, I wanted to have that moment.